Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends, and welcome to JCB Live. Today, the happy hour is in person with one of the most iconic, legendary men in Napa Valley. Not only he come from the hardcore of the United States, Colorado, one of the best states of all states, and at the same time, one of the best family of making great wines in the history of the United States. He got, of course, his graduate studies, big MBA. He's part of YPO and part of many fantastic organizations, including the Napa Valley uh, Vintners and Growers and many more. He'll tell us all about it. And he's the owner of one of the most iconic Oakville Napa Valley Winery, Silver Oak, to me and a new project he's launching. He is fabulous and his voice is as good as the king himself. Woo! David, welcome. John Charles, wonderful to be here. Thank well, you. That was well, very well done. Very well done. So exciting. So David, do you have bubbles sure. before you start singing? Well, always a little bit because usually I'm with my friend Jeff Gargiulo, who, as you know, loves his glass of bubbles usually starting before lunch so well i remember your fantastic performance to support the fires you remember at the lincoln theater and you were having bubbles just before performance oh that's so, true that's true today's another so, performance sometimes we have a little bit of bubble sometimes we have a little bit of moonshine <laughs> so it depends on depends on the gig <laughs> so bubbles is something you don't produce yet we have made uh we tried one vintage of it part of our mantra to me is experimentation and we did make a rosé that ah. we decided not to make again. That's all I will say about <laughs> that. So we've also made Syrah, we've made Zinfandel, we've tried different things with Tumi, but you know, those are fun things to do. But, well, we can always so. drink the Burgundy's bubbles sure, together. For sure, These are, and this is beautiful. Thank you. So David, tell us about this incredible upbringing in Colorado and, and what made you come to California because what a life. Well, yeah, I was born in Durango, Colorado. My father was an entrepreneur um, who uh, got interested in skiing, yeah. at, like in the 50s in Aspen, and decided to open a ski area in Durango, Colorado called Purgatory Ski Resort. So my dad was the founder of Purgatory. Interestingly, he met a Forest Service agent who wanted to build a ski area, which is pertinent to Silver Oak. So. Few years later, he comes out to Napa Valley at uh, the request of Jack Novak, whose family, uh, you know, Jack and Mary founded of Spotswood. Spotswood, yeah. <clears throat> Jack, of course, tragically passed away in the 70s. Um, but uh, Jack and my dad were friends from college. And so he came out here, got very interested in Napa Valley very early on. And you have to realize that in those days, a lot of people don't can't identify with this, but I remember as a kid that you know, we weren't growing Cabernet. That's we right. We were growing prunes and stone fruits. And we were and 1970. Gamay and Chablis. And, That's you it. know, and, and yeah, so we're 1970. And then in 72, dad bought uh, the dairy farm, uh, which is now where Silver Oak is. And so, oh, it, was so it was a dairy. a dairy farm. It was a dairy farm. It's from milk so, to Cabernet. Yeah. I think so it's our a good original, evolution. Our original building where we... Uh, laid down the first barrels was actually uh, where they milk cows. But were you raised enjoying wine at home so, as well? So that, so, you know, as I grew up, uh, we would come out here frequently. One of my great memories was driving across the Golden Gate Bridge with my father and the streak was on, which is an old song from the 70s. If you don't know it, look it up. <laughs> and uh, it's a very funny song about Ethel. And, um, and my dad and I laughing uproariously when I was a little kid. So we you know, we would come out here a lot, um, but I principally stayed in Colorado. But, you know, we, then we were in the wine business and as Silver Oak began to grow and become something a little more serious, um, you know, we would come out here a lot. And then in the early 90s, uh, really late 80s, release day started as a tradition. Yeah. And then that became a family thing. So everybody came to every release day. Um, and then, of course, uh, we ended up acquiring full ownership of Silver Oak. We were partners for the first uh, 30 years with uh, the Meyer the family. family. Great. And so um, and then in 2001, um, I helped orchestrate buying out the Meyer family. Um, and as, that, a graduate it's just school. Duncan, as a graduate school project, yeah. which is a pretty cool project when yeah. when your project <laughs> becomes reality. Yes, it took it took eight, eight years, but it, <laughs> it well, did. good for you. And it then. Happened. 
And then I was working in Denver at the time, and my dad literally walked into my office one day and said, what would you think about moving to Napa and running the winery? And I was like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> sure. Well, and, we, uh, we, we got we to gotta move to some wines. So yeah. But so you were in the oil business to start with. Is that correct? Yeah. My full-time thing early on in my career was in the oil and gas business. Yes. Which is a very I was a, what they call a land man. So okay. uh, that's the guy who like negotiates the contracts gets the drilling rights, not the geologist or geophysicist or engineer that drills the wells. I but see. It's kind of the legal part of it. So you as a family have still oil holdings? And Very small. I mean, since my father's passed away, that's not really what we've pursued. We're, we're in the ranching business and the wine business. And, you know, we're growing... The wine portfolio with a few other new projects and things like that. Which is so. very well, and we'll talk about that. But so yeah, tell us cheers. about, cheers, the ranching, because I understand you grow some of the finest bison in the world. Bison, right? right. Yes. And, and um, yes, yeah, so we have a sip of that. Yeah, for sure. It's so fun to talk bison, to talk ranching, to talk oil, to talk wine. Maybe wine, a bottle of wine is, is now more value of a barrel of wine than it is a barrel of oil, right? Justin Meyer, actually, I was at the dinner where Justin figured that out on the back of a napkin. And I think the price of oil at that time was about $12 a barrel. And Justin said, my, my, my barrels are worth $2,000 a barrel or whatever it was at the time. So, it was, yeah, it's great fun. Um, so, so the, ranch, wine, the ranch is in northern Colorado. Yeah. Um, another passion of my dad's. <clears throat> he was a great entrepreneur, but... Every business he was in was based on Mother Nature. Mm. So, you know, skiing, oil and gas, wine, ranching. So he started, the, not to go back there, but he started the resort. Yes. And it became a great resort to, to go skiing. Yes, until the early, until the drought of like 81, 82, where I the ski area was open for two weeks. And then that was tough. So the ranch has been wonderful. Uh, the wine business has been wonderful. For sure. Skiing was tough. We are not in the ski business anymore. <laughs> Just but, enjoy. But tell us about the ranch because you make great wine, obviously, which are phenomenal with red meat, needless to say. How, how is it uh, working to have a bison uh, ranch? So we've been, we've been in the ranching business for over 40 years um, and we raise uh, buffalo, American bison. Wow. Um, and we have about 650 mother cows. So it's a decent sized herd. Um, we also raise Coriantes, which is a roping steer. If you've, if you've ever been to a rodeo and yes. seen when they do I team roping, um, but we raise those for meat production do and you for roping rope? steers. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. we should yeah. do a session with you so roping. I have a, I have a, if Steve Hurst watches, watches this, Steve, I'm going to tell you right now, I'll still hold you to that bet. So I have a bet with Steve Hurst about it. Well, he's always watching. So we <laughs> so may, we may triple the bet. hope, but, um, <laughs> So anyway, the ranch is a great place. It's a wonderful, uh, you know, old Western experience to be out there with the bison and, and uh, um, you know, and a bottle and wild of animals and a bottle of Cabernet. Or, yeah. And so it, it's just a fantastic. So how is the uh, bison business these days? You know, it, it's, it's decent. I mean, it's the market's controlled a lot by one very large bison herd owner, yes. Mr. Turner. Turner, for sure. Um, but people are looking for authenticity for real meat for you know yeah. uh, uh, craft production which is really you know what we do at diamond tail it's called diamond tail the ranch and and the brand is known as diamond tail all the way through the restaurant so we have a uh, partner who uh, packages and makes the meat and yeah. so uh, we we uh, market it under uh, from Rocky Mountain Natural Meats. Nice. Um, and then the Coriannis are done as a thing called Prairie Legacy. So when are we going to see a Tumi or Silver Oak Bison brand coming out? I don't know. I haven't thought of that yet. So, you know, you're oh, always a step ahead. I <laughs> know. I will, I will be the buyer because I'm a big fan of bison. Yeah. And even this we weekend. We love serving it at the winery and at home. And you know, So good. Even yeah. as bison burgers. As, as burgers or, or, or those tenderloins are just perfect. A little yeah. salt and pepper on the grill. Got to eat them kind of rare, barely medium rare. And we hungry, delicious. we hungry. Yeah. So, David, big decision. Your father comes to your office and... Because in life, it's not easy to make those decisions as a family business. You're probably very comfortable in Denver running a great business. And he says, do you want to move west? What do you do? I went home to my wife, who at the time was the assistant chief of medicine at the University of Colorado at like age 32. Which is... She had a very big job. Exceptional. She's a, she's a, she's a physician. 
and uh and then but we both were kind of like yeah let's let's go and of course carrie now has her dermatology practice here and that's it can't you know she can't see people fast enough <laughs> so really so oh yeah they're very she's incredibly busy well right? and she's phenomenally personable as yeah, well and a very so good it doctor. makes the relationship even better with your doctor even yeah. when you don't want to go to your doctor in this case you want to go and see her so absolutely but um so easy decision you packed and you move west yeah and so our we had two little babies and one more was born out here um so wow. our, our our kids were all raised here uh we've lived in the same house in saint helena since we moved here um and so we live in town in saint helena and uh it's been fantastic and what fear did you go through <laughs> saying oof i'm going into something new that I, I don't really know i think maybe we want to keep this pg rated but my oldest brother i think summed it up well when i was leaving denver and mm -hmm. he knew that i was going coming out to sort of take over the day-to-day -day of the winery he said don't mess it up <laughs> <laughs> so that was the advice that i got so you know i mean silver oak was already a legacy it was a thing justin meyer was larger than life yes. he was a wonderful man you know one of my dad's best friends and so to all of a sudden say, well, what are we going to do now? For sure. And everybody looks at you. I mean, you know, you, you've, you've had the similar experience coming to California of and course. putting your mark on things. And yeah. so that's that was that's very intimidating when you're early 30s. For sure. Um, and so now I've been at it for 20 years, and <laughs> which dates me. But And now it's intimidating for the next generation. Not yet, because I keep telling them I'm not, move, I'm not getting out of the chair quite yet. So. No, we don't want you to. <laughs> They're way yeah. too young. Yeah. yeah. So you did, um, as we want to share with all our friends, um, to me was a very exciting new venture you did on West Side Road. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, because so we we did actually, I mentioned it before, but we actually started to me with the idea of, you know, at Silver Oak, life is a Cabernet. Mm -hmm. We are, we've been completely dedicated to Cabernet from the beginning. We only make two wines. So we started to me to sort of explore other varietals. Yeah. Um, so we've made uh, Merlot, um, the second year we started making Pinot Noir. Yeah. Um, we, you know, today, uh, and as I mentioned, we've experimented with other varietals and had a lot of fun with it. But today what Toomey principally focuses on is Pinot Noir and we make an Estate Sauvignon Blanc. <clears throat> so Spectacular wines. The Estate Sauvignon Blanc is from four different vineyard properties, two in Napa, um, mm -hmm. two in Sonoma County, That's and right. all of which, of course, we own. Um, and then uh, Pinot has... We make essentially two Appalachian blends, the Russian River that we're enjoying today, yep. um, and then an Anderson Valley. And then we're now making 10 single vineyard wines. Wow. Um, as well as a little bit of a blend in Oregon. So we have, we bought a prop, we've, we've acquired a number of really fantastic sites, um, including Dick Erath's home property sure. up in Oregon. Great um, move. Of course, Dick, today. Dick was one of the early pioneers. Yeah. Of the, um, the man who really started Pito up there. Yeah. Right? He was definitely in the early class, yeah. You know, David Lett and yeah. Dick, and so it was. Um, so we've had great fun with it, and I think that you know we're trying to make wines that sort of fit into the Duncan family mold of you know our goal with wine is to have it served with food at your table, that and is, so that is our that is our principal. Goal. How does it feel from the Cabernet, phenomenal, iconic Napa Valley Cab Oakville, powerful, all American oak to move to very sensual, very elegant, and extremely refined Pinots. Well, I think my brother, Tim, is a, is a fantastic Burgundian uh, palate yes. and has a wonderful collection. So he he was, he, and frankly, I didn't drink a lot of Pinot when we started to me early sure. on, but um, you know, I have now. So, which is also kind of refreshing because it doesn't, we're not trying to make Burgundy in California. Right? Yes. We're trying to make our style of Pinot Noir, um, very you know, there, important. Some of the some of the some of our uh, vintner brethren made uh, very rich, ripe, over the top style of Pinot, yeah. just like there's Cabernets made like that. We're trying to make something that's a little more elegant, a little more food friendly. Um, I fully agree. And so you know, I think that's and this is just a baby. This is the 2018. So, but tell us about your commitment as well, which I really admire in all what you do. And this is. Our commitment of, of decades and decades in lead certified, organic, biodynamic. I mean, you're moving a lot into this direction, right? Yeah. So our efforts in, in the overall sustainability uh, area really began in the vineyards about 20 years ago. 
Um, and so very uh, exciting. I have a Tim and I both have a certificate from when we were in grade school that we were members in good standing. I think Tim was one of the founders actually of a, an organization in our little public grade school in Denver called the Claw. Oh, so Claw stood for Clean Land, Air, and Water. I see. Um, I think we should revive it and start it over again. But great but, name um, too. <clears throat> yeah. So you know, like we got to claw our way out of this. Yeah. And so, so it's something that you know, I, I grew up on the ranch and 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 farming and you know being around uh, natural resources and thinking about that. So you know, it, as we as I came out here, I, I always was questioning why do we do things like that? Yes. Why, why do we? And I think that was one of the advantages of not being a kid who grew up in Napa. You know, I, I was kind of tangential to it and around it, yeah. but I, but I didn't, frankly, I didn't understand a lot of things. And so I was learning. Um, so and I you could a ask the questions. questions. Yeah. And you feel comfortable asking questions. And then from way. a winery standpoint, our seminal moment was when our Oakville winery burned down in 2006. Um, we had our own personal fire. Uh, you know, I used to be the only vintner whose winery had burned down. Unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. But so uh, the winery just burned. We, we had a dumpster fire. Oh, uh, and it was crazy. a windy February morning and the dumpster was parked up against the building. Um, and so it caught the building on fire and the wind just, just took the building down. But no pun intended, silver lining into this because you rebuild it. Yes. Better. And, and then, so then we had, you know, we had grown and again, the original building was a dairy barn. So yeah. we'd grown in that space for a long time and we were able to build a winery just to make this bottle of wine. Huh. And so, and that, and then since then, we've done the same thing in the Alexander Valley, where we've, you know, again, applied those principles of sustainability. So both of our Silver Oak wineries are certified lead platinum. Congratulations. Um, and the Alexander Valley winery also earned the distinction of being a living building, um, which is, which is, uh, it's only the 25th living building in the world. So there's, a, there's seven So explain what it means, living building. <clears throat> yeah. So there's seven qualifications which include like uh, health and human happiness, beauty, yeah. um, and then energy use, uh, water use. So yeah. you have to produce more energy and use less water um, than you use. And so it's, it's uh, so like our water use, we use 3.2, approximately 3.2, uh, we, re excuse me, re we reuse a gallon of water yeah. 3.2 times. 3.2 times, yes. and that's so, commanding. Um, and we make about 105% of our annual energy needs um, with our solar panels and, and so they, so we were able to, to get that distinction. And, that, and that's something that you've not done on paper. You have to prove it over a year yeah. of time. And, so and the that. measurements and quantify yeah. it. Yeah. But explain our friends how difficult it is when a catastrophe happened. What went through your mind? The dumpster burns the whole winery. So you have many paths to go. Share the difficult challenge you, you obviously experienced and how you solved it. So there, there's a... Um, uh, there's a funny story about that, which I know you don't know. And so you just set me up very nicely. With that. But <laughs> Good. so we, so we, the fire happened. Um, I was actually at the gym in town here and my wife called and said, Pumping or winery, kicking, yeah, or? no, I was pumped, you know, I was pumping some iron, I think. And, and the, the, uh, my wife called and said, um, the winery is on fire, 6:20 in the morning. And wow. so I get in my truck. I so actually thank God followed, you the gym early. I followed one of the St. Helena Fire Department down. I used to say I'm one of the only people who's driven 70 miles an hour on Highway 29. Yeah. And so, which is illegal to follow a fire tender, but the guy who was uh, driving it knew me. And so he's like, come on, come on. And so anyway, we pull around the wineries, you know, what they call fully involved. Wow. So we go through the whole thing. We have 50 firefighters. It was a five alarm fire. It was a big fire um, at the time. Not like one of our forest fires, but... Uh, significant for us yeah. and for the valley. So it's kind of over. Uh, one of the wonderful things happened, I have to interject this, is that about 1030 in the morning, a van pulled into the driveway and they said, um, uh, you know, we're here. And I was like, I came up to him. I said, you, you have to leave. Like, we're, you know, it's closed. The winery's closed. He said, no, 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 no. I'm coming from Leslie Rudd, Oakville Grocery, yeah. delivered sandwiches for everybody oh he brought like so 150 good. sandwiches oh and it was and at that moment all of a sudden i realized i'm starving hungry and yeah so it was sure. a wonderful neighborly thing um and so because anyway, the Oakville grocery is only a mile from yes, silver oak yes and there's a lot of silver oak at the Oakville grocery as well and vice so, versa it was it was wonderful so um but then you know a couple hours later we're down my dad's house is just at the end of the lane i see and so we're sitting in my dad's house people are crying nobody's saying anything 
And all of a sudden, I think it was our CFO said, you know, she's sitting there and she's really upset. She says, what are we going to do? And I look up and I said, we're going to rebuild the winery. And it, all of a sudden it was like, everybody relaxed and we opened a couple of bottles of wine. And that was the beginning of the plan right there that afternoon. We said, you know, we got hit hard, and we're, yeah. but kick us while we're down and we're going to get up. That's right. And so we started right then. 19 months later, we were ready for crush. And you rebuild it much better than much it was, better than it was. obviously. Yes. As you said, resilience pushes you. There was, there was no it. way to kind of fix up the old place and do it right. Yeah. So we took everything down um, and uh, and started from the beginning. And that, you know, that was now it's been, uh, this was our 13th vintage. That's right. In the new winery. And we really haven't changed much. We, we, we and you went job. right the way you wanted in terms of architecture, L, lead, vision, solar panels, the whole thing. We kind of wanted the architecture to honor what was there. I mean, we had a wonderful uh, past. Yeah. So except for like the old winery was built out of split face CMU, it's basically cinder block. And yeah. the new winery is built out of reclaimed limestone from Kansas. Very the, cool. The rock was 150 years old. And and so uh, we just sort of upgraded, you know, what was there. But and then from a winemaking standpoint, again, we had the opportunity to really think about how we make silver oak we only make one wine at the facility, um, and so we could optimize, you know, our for our our all of our tanks for yes. you know for for fermenting and pressing and blending and all of those different you know. Well, aspects as we it. talking about it, shall we try it? Sure. Me... So it's amazing. One wine. This is kind of the dream of all wineries. How could we succeed and be as successful with one wine, right? Yes. So how did that come about? The the story of one wine. You know. Justin, um, as our founding winemaker and, of course, uh, co you know co owner and partner in the beginning, um, he, he had worked. He was a Christian brother, mm -hmm. so he was at the Christian yeah. Brothers Winery working for Brother Timothy. I mean, it goes into the whole fabric of you know the history of the Napa. history of Napa. And Justin met Bonnie and decided to leave the order. Um, and then he met my dad, and they decided to start Silver Oak. So Justin was a simple man. And he said, I don't want to make all, I've been making 30 wines at Christian Brothers and Brandy and everything else that they did. And he said, he said, I just want to make Cabernet Sauvignon because I believe that's the future of Napa, which he was right. Um, I think God and, and so, enlightened him that day. And so we were, you know, in what they call the class of 72 now. We didn't know that at the time. Um, and then Justin was friends and influenced by Andrei Chelichev, who mm -hmm. was, of course, making wines at BV and... Yep. Uh, using American oak, and so um, so we started that from the very beginning. Um, we don't use American oak in Tumi, so we're not we're not uh, purists yeah. about American oak. French oak has a wonderful. But you place. went very far to the point that you bought your own cooperage. We have our own cooperage now. Yeah, we. we that been, was a big move. We started buying barrels from those guys in like 1978, 1979, somewhere around there, and then formed a partnership with them in 2000, and then and then. I might have some control issues, but we took <laughs> we bought out our partner you might as a few well. years ago. So, so that started on the premise of American oak, and and what was the underlying statement of all the wines at the time were made with a lot of French oak, as we know. So, how did that come about? Well, there were a couple things that were happening, especially in the early seventies, that wines were trying to emulate Bordeaux. They really were doing that, and so they were built. Very big tannic style, of yes. course, like 12% alcohols in those days. Yeah. But big tannins, uh, all French oak. Um, and then the vintner would tell you, you know, don't open this for 20 years. And Justin was German and kind of, you know, <laughs> had a German heritage and just, he just was a, a different thinker. Mm -hmm. So he said, I want you to drink my wine when you open it so you buy more. That's right. And so we started uh, with the American oak. We made a, you know, a, a more approachable style of wine, um, still keeping alcohols moderate. Um, and then we aged it for five years before we released the wine. So like we're, we're this is the 2015 Napa. That's right. Which we made in 20, you know, and now it's now 2020. So this has been, we're in the fifth year after vintage. So we and still finally you release it. And it's one of my favorite entrepreneurial things about my dad. Because imagine if a young man came to you today and said, I want to make the 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024. And then we'll start selling in 2020 and see if anybody <laughs> likes it. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, we, we didn't sell very the first, for your cash first bottle too. of Silver Oak till 78. That's we were very small at the time, but, but um, 
So it's been great fun, and we still do the exact same thing today. Really? So the wine that we produce this year will not be in the market till 2025 for Silver Oak. Well, congratulations. And, and how is it to really be involved in your own cooperage? Because there's nothing more fun than to make your own bags. Oh, it's, and, you know, I mean, you, I know you have experience and yeah. background with it. So many people don't, you know, don't even know what a cooper is. And so, yeah. you know, we have one of the, one of the very few master coopers in the U.S. that works with the cooperage. Um, there's so much to it behind uh, growing trees, um, you know, uh, literally farming the trees to cut them down to make into staves, yeah. aging the wood. Um, and then, of course, each barrel is literally like making a piece of furniture. That's right. Um, so your viewers might like this is one of my favorite little stats that you can use at a, at a wine tasting. Yeah. Do you know how many, uh, do you know how long it takes a tree to get big enough to cut down to make a barrel? 350 years? No, it's not that long. No. Not in America. That's what we say. Not in America. <laughs> 80 years. Oh, 80 years. In America. Well, that's a long period of time still. And then you get one barrel per acre per year. Really? That's a good stat. So, and that's probably true in France too. So enlightening. So if you use, yeah. you know, 500 barrels in your production, yeah. Yeah. You, if you had 500 acres of oak forest, you would be fully sustainable forever. Mm. Right? Because yeah. you don't clear cut. You just that's go right. and selectively right. cut. So do you think Silver Oak started a new trend in, in wine drinking in America as far as the style? Well, you know, it's funny because I think there are people who say that and there are people who it's a little controversial, right? Is it? So I think that Silver Oak is unique in its approach to Cabernet, um, which I think has been, you know, a wonderful benefit to us. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, many vintners... Um, are, are trying to follow a trend or follow yes. a style. We've been, you know, blissfully free of any critics. And so we appreciate, you know, the accolades as much as anybody else does, but we're not chasing that. It's not that important to us. Uh, we actually don't submit the wines generally. Oh, really? Occasionally they get, they get scored, but that's not really that important to us. So I think, you know, what we've had the opportunity to do is create a wine that people love. Mm -hmm. One of the things that so many wine drinkers have told me is that, their epi I call it your epiphany wine, where you yes. first taste wine and you say, oh my God, this is incredible, the silver oak. And it takes them down a rabbit hole to where they drink, you know, everything else as well. Did you but, fall in love with it right away yourself? Uh, my epiphany wine was the 85 Alexander Valley yeah. silver oak, and um, which coincidentally was approximately released when I turned 21. But but it was it was not that I didn't drink wine before that, but, but that was the first time I tasted a wine that I remember that I said, I, I said, this is, this is incredible. This is it. You know? Yeah. And so it, it was funny that, you know, one of my other great wine drinking experiences was with uh, Justin and Ray. And we drank a bottle of 58 uh, Inglenook and a bottle of 58 BV together in Oakville. Wow. And um, that was, when, a, that, was, that was a big experience for me. So one of the great things is I, I, you know, I went up to Justin and I said, <clears throat> how long are we going to let these stand, you know, sit there before we drink them? And, Justin goes, no, you can't do that. You got to taste them right away. And then we're going to taste them over time. So people always ask me, you know, how long should I, how long should I let a bottle of silver oak sit open before I drink it? And I'm like, don't do it. that. Go for it. <laughs> you know, and then see how it changes and see how it evolves and don't miss out on that, you know, that's uh, development. So, that, so that's a lot of fun. Now, David, you're very involved as well with the vintners and all the organization in Napa. So on a more general statement, if we take that style of wine, where do you see a stylistic evolution in, in the Napa Valley? Well, I think, you know, in my opinion, I think some of our uh, fellow vintners in Napa Valley in general has kind of taken their foot off the gas of the more, more, yes. more richer, riper, more alcohol. So I think you're seeing wines that are coming back a little bit towards the mean, a little, in my opinion, a little bit more drinkable, yes. enjoyable, ageable, because I think some of the wines that uh, were made in the last 20 years you know they didn't. They have. They've shown not to age that well because they right. because they weren't balanced. That's they were it. fruity and you know fruit forward and kind of maybe a little sweet and honestly. So um, you know, and I think there's a place for that. People enjoy those wines and and so I think it's to, to each his own. But I think in general, you know, we're seeing um, much more focus on viticulture today. Yes, I and mean, I think that is the most important thing that's happening in wine right now. Uh, technology in the vineyards, Very much our understanding so. of water use, of canopy management. You know, it's the old yeah. days of kind of growing grapes is, is, uh, it's is more precise. It's more precise now. Yeah. So now what inspires you for you in the wine world? Besides you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was really <laughs> Cheers. And Silver Oak. 
By the way, your pedo was outstanding as well. Thank Needless you. to say, but thank you. It, it's so exciting to talk about such an iconic wine as well as silver oak. I think the thing that is most inspirational to me is our customers. We at the winery we call them bottle stories. Yeah. So and with social media today, you know we can literally interact with individuals with every individual and hear all these bottle stories, see all the bottle stories. So a bottle story is, you know, somebody says, I'm at my uh, kid's wedding or, yeah. or, you know, we're at a graduation or a funeral or a life remembrance or, you know, whatever. And they're having a bottle of silver oak or they're, you know, we have, with them. we have Draymond Green and LeBron James uh, make a bet over, I think it was some college game with a case of silver oak, you know, so like, that's a great, that's a you know famous person bottle story, but there's just, there's just a lot of uh, joy mm -hmm. and, and, um, uh, and importance really that we bring to people's lives with wine. Yeah. And I think that that's a very special thing. If that doesn't inspire you, you're not in the right <laughs> business, right? Uh, absolutely. So, now on that note, um, what do you think are the challenges that Napa is facing that you're helping to, to guide in the right direction in the future because not every wine region obviously is a long flowing gentle flow and uh, what's your view on that well i think you know some of the challenges that we thought we were facing three years ago have gone by the wayside so yeah um the challenges that we're facing now really are healing our community from the recent fires yeah i mean that is uh, a big deal a couple of our you know top resort hotels are gone yeah or seriously damaged um i think that we need to focus on what this place is, um, which is an agricultural wine growing area, and we need to sell wine to sustain that. Yes. And so in my opinion, you know, that is the most important thing. We have to welcome people who are interested in our wines. Mm -hmm. We have to provide for them. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got funny stories about, about people who've lived here for 10 or 12 years that have their opinion about too much of tourism, too yeah. much this, too much that. Tell me about it, it. It's not. It's that's, that's why not we're right. here. It's not right. So, so we have to. We have to. Uh, you know, and I think we. You know, I have the perspective that I've been around Silver Oak for. Next year will be our fiftieth vintage. You know, so I've been around since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, but I do understand that I can think about the next fifty years. Yeah. I mean, I really do think that I can. That's right. I don't know if I'll be around for the next, hopefully, but oh, I think if I drink enough are. red wine. With the way you are we'll on stage, it. and we're so. going to talk about that now. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think that's an important thing. That yeah. That's the future of Napa Valley is to, well said. You know, is to make sure that we sustain the good things that we already yeah. have. And I share it because from the practices in the vineyards all the way down to welcoming our guests. Absolutely. And listening to that crystal and sound. To that. I, was, I am admiring that. <laughs> well, we're going to have to try Timeless, but what is your passion? David, besides Silver Oak and Toomey and Ovid, because you just acquired this wonderful winery as well in Timeless, there's a few passion that most of our friends with us tonight know, but you have a big passion. Well, I enjoy playing music, which has been um, uh, largely something that yeah. I did um, alone for a long time until I met our friend Jeff Gargiulo. Exactly. Um, and because so, you, were, you were solo before you were playing? Not solo in front of people, solo like yeah. literally by myself. Oh, so, really? Yeah, it was because, because, you know, it's it just was something I enjoyed doing. I play guitar and um, uh, Larry McGuire from Farniente was of the same, same way. You know, he, He's he, great. he and I always compared notes that it was just something because I'm not a natural performer or, an, you know, sort of an out there kind of guy like some people I know. And so um, and he is a natural performer. And so well I've learned to do that. But um uh so Jeff, you know, so Jeff got me hooked into the band thing. So yes. we have we have our band called the Silverado Pickups now. Um we have lots of claim to flames of people that we've warmed up for and that we've played every bottle rock and we've recorded a couple songs. Um, and you've so played at the Napa Valley it's, Wine it's Auction. Been, we played at Napa Valley Wine Auction. We played I'm gonna show radio. you that little piece. We played right in the radio. Now. We also know that wine is about enjoyment and uh, as we say on the label uh, it's really made for belly laughs and epic toasts so I'm gonna play a little piece of this you guys have already heard me play a song and then uh, I might turn it over to one of my pro friends so uh, but this is timeless this is the David Duncan version to timeless <laughs> Western sky you went to find to open space where the river winds. 
mountains high Sunny days The stars that shine in the Milky Way Like fine wine Like kindness That's what you are to me Timeless So yeah, but this is very exciting. So how do you create a band? Advise us on how we do that. You have a talent. Jeff tells you we should create something together and you do. It kind of developed and kind of came together. And I think yeah. it was just a, a natural thing. And, and, you know, we've the, the core band that we have now has been together for, I think, eight or nine years now. That's a big deal. And so um, we, of course, we had a bunch of stuff canceled this year because of COVID. Um, yeah, we're still trying to get together once in a while. You get together, right? Not still. be too rusty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just a backup singer though. Sorry. So, no, no, you're the amazing singer. So you basically got together and, and so you perform a, in normal circumstances pretty much every week from what I understand. We would, we would, if we have a gig, we would yeah. get together and play once a week uh, to, to do the rehearsals. That's it. And I think, um, um, you know, the rehearsals are almost the best part about it. It's kind of like poker night with the guys. You know, we'd go down, we'd open a couple bottles of wine. Jeff would usually have some food for us and because the studio's on his property. Yeah, great and, studio. Uh, you know, we play music for three hours and what, what could be more fun than that? Do you play poker after? Or no, that? we just play music and then everybody goes home. We all have, you know, jobs and kids and are very, you know. And how a, did you discover that talent of yours in music? Oh, Jeff did. Really? <laughs> no, but I mean, as a I, child, though, you 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 learned. I didn't and... start playing guitar until I was in college. Oh, my really? roommate in college had a guitar, and um, um, and so I, you know, I picked it up and I played a G chord, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, I, you know, I can do this, and so I have fun with it now. Um, well, you know, and, and dear friends, I can tell you, as you've seen the little video, they are amazing, and not only they play in all the major events in Napa Valley, but. You all travel as well to you being asked to perform on on big stage. Yeah, we played for at Emerald's char charity event in New Orleans a couple times. Yeah. We played the Bluebird Theater in Nashville, which if you watch a show in Nashville, uh, you know what that is. Or if you've been to Nashville, it's where they discover yeah. all all the stars. Um, you know, we've we've just had a great opportunity, uh, and it's and it's tons of fun. It's tons of fun. A group of friends playing music, having a great time on stage. Yeah. What, what is actually your best memory on, on stage? Was it at the Napa Valley Wine Auction when you were cheering and you broke all the records? I think... Because that was a great one too. I think that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, I think the... Probably my best memory was at the Lincoln Theater in Yonville. Yeah, yeah. When, and it was actually our first real gig as the Silverado Pickups. Um, we were asked to warm up for Tim McGraw. Ooh. And I've never been more terrified in my entire life than right before we went out on stage. <laughs> it was just awful. And then we had a 20 minute set and that time went by like that. I mean, just so, but seeing 1200 people out there that were waiting for Tim McGraw, granted, but they were, you know, the packed house and all of a sudden it was like, wow, this is fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. That energy that you got from that is pretty cool. Well, so. I would say it's timeless. Timeless. <laughs> yes. So, you know, this is one of my favorite expression. Give time time. It's timeless. So tell us about this, because this I did not even know of the existence except a few months ago when we were together in, in Naples. So this is Timeless Napa Valley. Um, this was actually uh, begun. This wine was started as a song, literally. Um, my father and I uh, share the same birthday. Here are the lyrics, And right? there's the lyrics on the back of the bottle. And my father and I shared the same birthday, which is October 23rd. So my birthday was just last week. Well, and, happy birthday. And uh, we were 35 years apart. So every five years, we would celebrate a milestone birthday. Yeah. So I was going to be 50 and he was going to be 85. And what do you give Ray Duncan for his birthday? So I thought, I'm going to give him a song. Oh. So I went down to Gargiulo's, of course, he's been my musical pal, and our friends, uh, Monty Powell and, and Anna Wilson were there, and we sat down over a couple bottles of Pinot Grigio, <laughs> and I had this concept around timelessness with my yeah. dad, like he, you know, he he came out west, he was in ranching and yeah. all that stuff, so Monty loved it, so we wrote Timeless uh, to honor my dad. Us? 
I and think we, we need I'll to have hear a clip. I have a clip for you, but <laughs> I'm not going to sing it live right now. But I could, but I'm not going to. Well, but because after Silver Oak, after Toomey, and now Timeless, your voice, voice is ready. The voice, yeah. So, so, uh, so then, um, so we wrote the song, and then unfortunately, my father passed away two weeks before our birthday. Uh, he did say before he died, "Have the party." He, he gave me a direct order, so we did have the party, uh, but it wasn't the same. So, so then Timeless kind of became um, an anthem for us a little bit to remember yeah. Dad. The song did. Uh, I read it. I read his eulogy at his funeral, and I read the I read the song as a poem um, at his funeral, and 750 people burst out into applause. Wow. We had Monty Mass sing it as celebration of life, and so so then a couple of years later, we were talking about making a single vineyard wine from So Canyon, which has been our flagship vineyard for Silver Oak since '99, and we've as I mentioned before, we have all these pinots that we've been doing That's single right. vineyard. So I'm like, how could we do Soda Canyon in a bottle like that is that is, sure. honors the vineyard in its best way? And so Nate Weiss, our winemaker, came yeah. up with a blend for Timeless. So it's a pr proprietary red blend, yeah. single vineyard wine, um, and 2017. We, and we said this is 2017. So this is the inaugural vintage. So you don't um, wait five years like Silver. We didn't. We decided not to do that. So it's a little more in the traditional. See, his business model. background is back to the NBA balance of the PNL now. <laughs> but what we did do is we put it in three packs only. Yes. So you can only buy it in a three pack because it's timeless. You cannot have one bottle. I so love that was it. The, that was the idea. So this um, is great. And 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 uh, so we were able to to get the label and wow. that's timeless Napa Valley. And and the exciting thing is I know what the. 18, 19, and 20 are going to be, and this is going in a good direction. So wow. we're excited about it. So, uh, David, tell us a little bit about the blend, maybe, just for our friends who are not tasting with us. If you if you divulge a few, not the percentage, but maybe just... Well, so this blend is uh, predominantly Merlot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the softness and sort of, you know, um, that mid-palate you get. And then... Um, uh, about equal amounts of Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon, a little Petit Verdot. Ah, so it's um, so it's a Napa blend. All grown Forget at Bordeaux. All grown at Soda Canyon. Yeah, um, and uh, it's a proprietary blend, right? So love it. Yeah, and and it, every year is a little bit different, so it's going to sort of depend on, you know, how Soda Canyon behaves. Um, we've also we're undergoing some replanting there, which we're now planting some blocks that will go into Timeless in the future. Um, and so that's very exciting. And small production, I imagine. Small production, yes. Yeah. Yes, very small Only production. three packs, I love it. Yeah. So, David, what's your dream now in life, in general? I mean, you've accomplished so much from the family business to the ranch to your fabulous wife, your three children. David is very involved and there's a wing at the school that should carry his name and I hope it will <laughs> because the Montessori program exist in many ways thanks to you oh, there was there are many many you know families that were involved in no that. but before but we, we even go to your dream t tell us uh your your active life with your kids because that's very common. well the kids are growing up i've got two in college now and yeah. my my youngest is in high school so uh but you were very involved in their education yes in montessori school and then we sent them to sonoma academy yeah uh, they had a wonderful experience there um, they all did very well they all speak spanish they all they're, you know, they're, they're great. One that's great. Kids. And thank God they, I had their mother to raise them. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's often the case. Yeah. Yeah. So no, they're, they're No, but uh, I want to thank you because our ladies go to the Montessori and we've seen all your incredible involvement in the you, building. You have to have some faith to send yes. your kids to Montessori, but, and I'm not talking religious faith. I'm talking about educational faith. I've given them a few phone calls. What do you think of that school? It's, that's true. But it's, it's. With the way the kids turn out is really special and really unique. So I love the Montessori. So story. I'm going to drink more to the yeah, Montessori. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. Gina, Gina knows. She knows. Yeah, she does. She does. Yeah. So give us your, your dream of, of something you want to now accomplish that you think you haven't or dream at large. I think, you know, if you'd asked me that a few months ago, I probably would have come up with something. Um, but I think, I think now it's, you know, it's supporting Napa. Yeah, I also like you have great interest in Sonoma County. Yes. So you know, I think wine country in general is something that you know we kind of need to get back on our feet. We've been dealt some blows. Yeah. And so I think in the next like five years, that's really where, where I want to put my heart. You know, mm -hmm. how do we think about forest management? How do we think about trees in general? How do we think about vineyards? How do we think about tourism? Um, you know, and I think promoting what's happening here. Yeah. You know, this is this is 
uh, with all due respect to the old world, you know, this this is definitely the most important wine region in the U.S. There's yeah, no question for about sure. It. And so, and in the world, and you know, and one of them in the world. I mean, yeah. certainly Bordeaux and Burgundy are up there. And so, um, but I think that uh, this is home. Yeah. Um, and we have so many incredible people. It's such a great community. There's so many great things that we can accomplish together. So, you know, I think I think that is, you know, my short term dream. I think what, what about term, a personal? What, yeah. Yeah. So, I think longer term, you know, I think it's to see Silver Oak carried on. Right. Yeah. Like this is something that my family's been part of from the beginning. Um, you know, we've we're, we've made we've made two thirds of the wine that Silver Oak has ever produced. It's the Duncan family has. And there's yeah. a way to look at it. Um, and so I think to carry that on um, and keep those bottle stories coming it's so gratifying if there's, you know, and, and to do stuff like timeless or have fun with to me. Um, that's right. You know, there's so many different things and we're not really, we did acquire Ovid, but that that's a different, it was a different circumstances because those were some of my very closest friends from the Montessori school who started that. That's right. They wanted to get out. So we're not like trying to do like M and a and, and buy up a bunch of brands. It's, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun to true. Develop it's, it's, it happened very organically and have it happen organically. I mean, this yeah. is the first, new brand that we've launched in 20 years i think it's great and so you know and it's i think it's going to be timeless i think people are really going to enjoy this wine so it's it's uh I, i'd like to see it lay down for a couple more years but yeah. but it's uh it's a beautiful i'm gonna have it wine. lay down in my stomach so. for a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but david so now any you know we had such a great discussion and you're such a great inspiration any big message you want to send to all our friends from all around the world now coming not only from you as the wineries, but for you as an individual, in the time we're living in, and in in the space we are right now. You know, I think the thing that I have been doing, John Charles, is slowing down. Aha! Uh -huh. That is the main thing. It's I've hard been doing. to believe. I travel all the time. I'm always, yeah. you know, on a plane. My, it just, it's been crazy. And so I think trying to relish the moment be in the moment, you know, being present with yeah. you right here, right now, Yeah. Uh, which we had a little complications getting this done, but for good Well, reason, there was a few fires, a few fires in between. you know, but, um, and I think that's a gift of this time that yes. we've been given, you know, and, and so for me, you know, uh, just trying to control what you can control and, and not fret what you can't, mm -hmm. you know, which uh, is something that wine helps you with. I think. Well, it's very well said and David, so, you not only say it, but you print it on your label. This is all here. Give time, time. Yeah. And a lot of time to give us back the time we deserve to live in our time. <laughs> I know it's a big statement. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you for being with us. The famous David Duncan himself. Thank you, David. John Charles. A pleasure. Always. Thank you. <laughs>